I, I just love history. I love facts that people don't know about. And George Washington, um, throughout my life, has been one of my heroes because he's he was such a statesman and 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 a great strategist. Uh, but more than that, I mean, he stood for something that um, I, I, we don't see too much of uh, in these in these later years, do we? Now that is so true. I mean that you know, ambition for the greater good rather than ambition for self and that vision of what to do next and, and the farewell address. I mean, it's amazing what message he was leaving to our country. Absolutely. And as a young man in my research, I read, uh, I, I read the book that his brother Lawrence wrote. Oh, wow, you really are a Washingtonian guy. Great. I tell you, uh, uh, and, and one of the things that struck me is, and, and uh, I'm sorry I'm stuttering around this, but George Washington had no sense of humor, did he? You don't see a lot of that. I mean, I wish I did. You know, that was the great thing about living with Lincoln. I could be laughing every day when I was with him because he would tell some funny story. I mean, you see every now and then a smile on his face in the portions when he's with Martha or when he's talking to Lafayette and toasting. Um, but there was a form of relaxation that he had, which he took enormous solace from, and that was Mount Vernon and being back at home. I mean, every leader needs to have some way to take the strains of, of leadership away. And writing letters about Mount Vernon, even when he wasn't able to get home, about what should be done in the fields, gave him that relaxation, just as telling funny stories did to Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, uh, Washington was, was really a homebody and, and just loved, you know, uh, we would call it puttering today, but, you know, he loved, he loved being at home. Absolutely. I mean, I think when he first gets home after the revolution is won and he takes off his army commission and takes off his uniform, you know, and people thought, how can he do that? He could have been a king at that moment. That's when the George III remark is made. You know, I, if he did that, he'd be the greatest man in the world, giving up power and going home. But that's what he wanted. You're absolutely right. He always wanted that. And then after the presidency is over and he declines to run for a third term, when he could have had a fourth, fifth, sixth, he could have had it as long as he lived. And then we would have had an entirely different presidency. And he's so happy to just get back home. And I, I just wish he had had more years to be at home before he died. He just needed that time at home more than ever. Now this new three-part series uh, talks about his youth, which, you know, we only know, I think, as, as common folk. I mean, you, you, you live with the presidents, but we only know a few things about George Washington's youth, but he had a pretty full uh, schedule as a young man, didn't he? No, it's absolutely true. And, you know, for me, as not a George Washington expert, I feel like I learned so much from my fellow colleagues and from the film itself about the adversity of his youth. I mean, his father dying at 11, he wasn't able to go to London like Lawrence and his half-brothers were. So his education was really his experience of being on that farm and then later being in the war and not having the, you know, as Adams did a Harvard or as, as Jefferson did a William and Mary, but he learned from experience and learned from war. And as Colin Powell points out, that learning from war is maybe the most important thing when you see the devastation of it, when you're so young as he was, 23, 24, no longer is war a romantic adventure. It's the worst kind of feeling. And, and that depth of experience, I think, really plays out in his life. Yeah, and, and, and strange as it may seem, he really did um, understand his enemy. I mean, he... Uh, you know, without without being a fan of 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 the British, he he understood how they thought and worked. Um, you're right, as you said earlier. I mean, he had a great strategic sense. I mean, he understood when he was with General Braddock that it wasn't right that they were taking so long to create this long road to get to Fort Duquesne that they'd be exposing themselves to to the fire, you know, to the fire of the other side of the French. He understood later that he had to give purpose to the soldiers when he was crossing the Delaware so that they would feel they were fighting for a cause that was bigger than just the next battle. And he reads Thomas Paine's great, you know, crisis article that had to do with the summer soldier. And he, he really had a step ahead. He understood at Yorktown what to do in order to build the trenches and cordon those guys off. So that, of course, becomes part of a, a person, personal understanding of the future in a certain sense and strategy, which is important when he becomes president as well. What kind of president am I going to be? Am I going to be able to be available to the people? Or am I going to be too too common, too common, but I don't want to be a king, so I sort of want to be a Republican king. <laughs> and he thinks it all out. 
And, and, and this series takes us through that step by step and, and gives us a really complete look at Washington that we haven't had before. I mean, we've had very, very interesting documentaries and, and, and biopics about George Washington, but this really gets into some of the nitty gritty uh, and the, ad, uh, the adversity that he faced as uh, a young man and as uh, leader of the, uh, uh, of the army. Yeah, well, I think we made the decision that for people to connect to him, it's so much more powerful when you watch him going through adversity, when you see his losses, when you see his warts and you see his mistakes, and then you watch him grow as a result of them so that it's not just asking you to identify with the victor in the, in the war or the president who's the first president or the guy on Mount Rushmore. So watching that journey, you know, as one of the historians said, he wasn't born great, um, but he took a journey to greatness. And then the viewer can take that journey with, with him and then feel connected to him the whole way through. That's what I always try to do when I spend so many years writing my books is to make people feel like they want to go along with him and they don't want him to see him die. By the time I came to the end of this film, I didn't want to see him die. I realized, oh my God, I'm connected to him now after 18 months of working on this in a way that I am after 10 years of living with the other guys because there's collaboration, there's teamwork. So a lot of other people's skills and, and values were imported into this joint project. It was really fun. Doris, thank you so much for your time this morning. I know you're busy with all the interviews and everything, but uh, I want to end this with... Uh by saying George Washington still has my favorite speech, no kings here. Uh, that says it all for me as it, far as it, who it this says man every, was. It says everything. You're absolutely right. No kings here. Yay. Yay. Doris, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.